إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مبل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار We praise Allah, we glorify Him, we thank Him for all His favors and bounties upon us. Indeed, we thank Him for Islam, that being the best gift one can hope to receive from Allah. We seek His help in all our affairs and we ask Him to make our feet firm in the path of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And thereby we expect by the grace and mercy of Allah to attain eternal bliss in paradise. Those whom Allah guides, nobody can mislead them, and those whom He leaves to stray, none can find for them guidance. I testify that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, and I also testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's final messenger to the whole of mankind. For the last two weeks we have been looking at uh, some of the themes and topics connected to signs before the Day of Judgment. I'm going to change the topic today to add a bit of variety, inshallah, because sometimes from the feedback I got I was recommended that we should not keep on talking about the same thing week on week after week like that and break it up in between the other talks. But anyway, in the two talks that we did for the last the past two weeks, one thing became very clear to us that as time progresses and we get closer to the day of judgment, things are going to get more and more difficult. Problems are going to come about and they'll increase in intensity and things are going to become very hard for Muslims. And <coughs> two things are liable to be affected in our hearts and minds if we don't take care. These turmoils of Fitan are going to try and destroy two things which are valuable to have for a successful person. One of them is faith in Allah, Abdawheed, faith in Allah properly, which then makes us responsible people preparing for our accountability in front of Him. And the second is our care and concern for the welfare of our, the people around us. Muslims, their rights, brotherhood, unity and so forth. So in one hadith we saw how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that he who loves to go to paradise and be saved from the fire, let him believe in Allah and the last day. Because belief is going to be under attack and it's going to be shaken for people who don't take care. And even if we think we have belief based on information, we might become careless about preparing for the last day, meaning accountability. And the second part of the statement was, and let him treat the others like he would like to be treated himself. Because even if we have knowledge and we are on Tawheed, the second thing that may happen is, is we begin to neglect giving rights to each other, maintaining brotherhood, and displaying the qualities of Iman with respect to one another. And these two things, if we get them wrong, will land us in great trouble on the Day of Judgment. Now, what makes us to become disobedient to Allah? What makes us to become people who are callous towards unifying Muslims and loving Muslims and hoping for their best and so forth. Nothing but pride. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, inshallah. The opposite of pride or 
humility. Because as you know, in one hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that he fears for us in the sense that nothing would be more damaging to us, harmful or destructive, worse than a hungry wolf let loose amongst a flock of sheep, than our greed for wealth and greed for fame in religion. We have these innate greeds. And we have a hadith here where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says Well imagine, imagine a world where nobody sins. Imagine we are all righteous people. We have knowledge to the hilt and we practice to the hilt. Everything according to Quran and Sunnah. Nobody is misbehaving outwardly at least. Nice, wonderful world, no sin. Should we be scared about anything else after that? When everybody is rightly guided, following the truth, should we be afraid of anything? So that's the hadith from Anas radiallahu anhu who said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, meaning in English, if you did not commit sins, I would fear for you something worse than that. Something greater than that. So there is something to be feared, even though we are living according to knowledge, inshallah. Something we should be afraid of for ourselves because the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam expressed concern about that regarding us. And he was closer to us than ourselves. And he cared for us more than we do for ourselves. And his concern was from faith and from knowledge Allah gave him. So what did he say? He said the pride, al kibr vanity or conceit. To be big headed and to resist the truth and so forth. So it is quite possible when we live in troubled times and we are living always in troubled times. It doesn't have to be when an enemy invades or great corruption or strife has broken loose. It's just the mere fact that we are away, far removed from the time of the Sahaba or a start. And knowledge has decreased and ignorance prevails and innovations abound. We are living in troubled times automatically in a confusing state. And we should be very careful because in troubled times we can become proud and haughty and stuck up like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a promise that He will give us paradise provided we satisfy two conditions in life. It's a promise Allah will keep, no doubt. Allah will not fail to keep His promise. So we have to make sure to keep our end of the bargain, which is to fulfill those two conditions. So what are those two conditions? تِلْكَ الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةُ نَجْعَلُهَا لِلَّذِينَ لَا يُرِيدُونَ عُلُوًا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فَسَادًا وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ That is the home of the hereafter, we shall give to those who do not seek high-handedness. عُلُوًا فِي الْأَرْضِ They don't seek to be high and mighty, domineering. To be tyrannical, to be, a, to be arrogant, lord over the others, wala fasada, and do not seek corruption. So, if we seek high handedness, we want to be, as it were, over and above what Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches. Or if we seek corruption because we follow desires and lust and so on, in the name of fun and entertainment and art and culture, we start promoting the undermining of values, moral values, then we don't have the security against the fire. No matter what our book knowledge, no matter which sect we claim to belong, no matter what we trumpet about under the banners that we wave. These two qualities must not exist in a Muslim. Trying to be high and mighty, arrogant, proud, and trying to be someone who becomes an agent to induce or support or propagate corruption. And the best result, the end result, which is best, is reserved for those who are truly God-fearing, people of Dhamma. Why? Why is this um, bad? Why is it wrong to be proud? Because pride leads to envy and jealousy. Pride comes along because we are not 
sufficiently acquainted with the recognition of Allah. Once we know Allah properly, that He is the Almighty, and all and everything good comes from Him, and we are recipients of the gifts, and we are entrusted to utilize whatever He has given us, and being accountable to Him, and so on, we become modest. We can't strut about and puff our cheeks up and walk around with chest popping kind of... We can't do that. Because it doesn't belong to me. It's not me. It's not by myself I kind of obtained it. Allah gave it to me. And He's testing me with it. And it's a favor for me. So how can I be proud? But there is an ayah in Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 105. One of the scholars brought this ayah in this context. The meaning in English it says, It is never the wish of the people of the book, never the wish of those without faith amongst the people of the book, Jews and Christians, nor of the pagans, that anything good should come down to you from your Lord. This is a statement of fact. Allah is informing us that when people are broadly classified into two categories, Muslims and non-Muslims, Generally speaking, we must know, because Allah told us so, non-Muslims do not want the best for Muslims. Why? Because they think they are the right people. They think they know best. They think they are always correct. We are the ones groping about in darkness, trying to be backward, trying to be emotional, trying to be reactionary, trying to be extremist, what have you. They have the experts, they have the analysis, they are following the intelligent path, of their philosophies and scientific this and that. So generally speaking, if anything goes wrong with them, you know, they will quickly excuse each other. But something good happens to a Muslim, then how could it? We are supposed to be the right people. The general state. What this is showing to us is jealousy and envy is one of the chief characteristics, one of the main hallmarks of the kafirun. <coughs> So imagine now Muslims have envy or hatred or jealousy towards one another. And it, well, we do, many of us do, on account of which it consumes us and we end up doing so much damage. Sometimes without a valid reason in the Sharia, if we start digging and analyzing and judging, we find that the root of it all was envy and jealousy. The backbiting, the slandering, the disreputing, the name calling, jealousy, envy. It is never the wish of those without faith amongst the people of the book, nor of the pagans, mushrikun in general, that anything good should come down to you from your Lord. But Allah will choose for his special mercy, whom he will, for Allah is Lord of grace abounding. So we as Muslims should never allow our hearts to be dirtied by these types of perception. And that's each one of us is our personal challenge or combat. Many people will come and try to justify why we need to hate and have contemptuous, contemptuous attitude towards so and so and this and that. It is down to you and me to make sure that if we have harbored any ill feelings or any kind of negative attitude towards a Muslim, it really was according to how Allah finds it pleasurable. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah he talked about the first ayah that we read <coughs> chapter 28 verse 83 and he says he explains that in Majmu' al-Fatawa and he said if you look at it the world is really full of four types of people in the context of that ayah four types of people the first type are those who seek both ulu and fasad they seek to be high and mighty to be lord over the others as well as they seek corruption. Who can these people be? Of course, I mean, there is a, there is a clear a guidance in the Qur'an. The Fir'aun is referred to as having both these qualities. Pharaoh. So anyone like the Pharaoh. So in this category falls, as the Shaykh said, kings and heads of the corrupt ones like Fir'aun and his party and so forth. We can say there are those who are in charge. If they have excuse, well and good. If they don't have excuse, it's very bad when they keep the Sharia at bay. And not only do they not allow the law of Allah to be implemented, they also open the doors of vices. They allow corruption to spread. All the institutions of vice and evil to
to spread and proliferate in the country instead of barring that avenues. This shape of Islam in the first category. Of course, we don't belong to that category. We, are not, we don't have any position at all in society, really. So, what's the second category? He said the second category are those people who do corruption but do not seek ulu. Who are these people? Well, the petty thief, for example, the pickpocket, the one who robs someone, thieves, this type of people, the one who is uh, perhaps putting up some dirty, printing some dirty magazine or a pornography site on the internet. Most of those people don't want to be known as the world leader in these enterprises, just doing petty and dirty things. But doing these things are causing corruption, at least they're bringing about distrust, insecurity and so forth in society. They do not have the security against the fire. So if there are people like that amongst the Muslims and they are learning Islam and praying, going to mosque, yet at the same time they are also promoting undermining, value undermining activities like dinner and dance party or something, a music a do, gig, or selling fags and or you know, some drugs, petty drug dealer in the street. He may be praying, maybe fasting, he ought to know, we need to advise them, such people if we know them. Really in the end, you are praying and fasting, at the same time you are playing with the fire. You are taking a gamble and you shouldn't gamble with Allah. Third category of people are those who seek ulu without fasad. And that's the group of people we have to be most cautious about. Because we might be part of that. Why? Because evidently we do not call to wickedness. Quite openly we call people to righteousness. We tell <coughs> friends, come to the Islamic circle, come to the mosque, let's pray with the Quran, do some charity, let's support the jihad. Many things like that, mashallah. And we start learning, picking up information, and that can go to our heads. Because as soon as a person becomes more religious, of course, it becomes noticeable. Automatically. You don't have to go out there looking for applause. People will notice, oh, he comes to the mosque more often. Oh, he's trying to go to bed. Oh, sister is wearing hijab now. Oh, he's praying more. They might then pat you on the back, or say nice things about you. And more, they might start referring to you in, in such a way that you feel you are now important, asking questions and so forth. It can go to our head. Then once we get a taste of this praise, we might want more of it through religion. So that's what the first hadith I read, or mentioned, I paraphrased, that the, the love for fame of religion is one of the most destructive things that we have to fear. Through religion we might seek prominence, recognition. Man, I'm a man of piety and knowledge and so forth. So they, are, they have also lost the security against the fire. They do not have guarantee of paradise anymore. They have openly violated a condition which is clearly stated in the Quran. So only the fourth category will survive and that's what the Quran in Ayah is saying. Those who are the people of paradise, they do not wish for ulu prominence and high-handedness, nor do they seek facade, corruption. They are humble people, very modest people. The more we increase in knowledge, the more we increase in humility. And that's how it ought to be, inshallah. So here's an ayah. This is from Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, ayah 54. O you who believe, meaning in English, if any from amongst you turn back from his faith, soon will Allah produce a people whom he will love as they will love him. Zul is the same as tawadu, same as haya, it's all interrelated, same thing. Modest, humble, soft, gentle, shy with the believers, compassionate. Another I said, Ruhama. And show mercy to one another. And strong against the rejectors of faith. If we have to be harsh and tough, be harsh and tough against those who wish to snuff out the light of Islam. It is no big deal. It's not, it's not a sign of Iman or maturism or anything to be harsh and rough with another Muslim. 
the more tolerant and forgiving and soft we are and back off without compromising truth, sacrificing truth, the more we increase in our prestige and power, as we will see, inshallah. So, whom he will love, as they will love him. Lowly or humble with the believers, mighty against the rejectors. If we cannot take on board this type of a quality in our life, lives, then we are not going to achieve very much because the results are expected at the hands of people who fulfill the pleasure of Allah by behaving what is satisfying to Him. The Sahaba loved one another because of faith, not because of the same country and same village. See, if we can't try to be like the Sahaba in this sense, even though the other people are nasty towards us, then we cannot hope to achieve anything. And nowadays we are all full of everyone against everyone else. Fighting in the way of Allah and never afraid of the criticisms of those who find fault. Yujahiduna fi sabilillah. They are constantly striving in the cause of Allah. When the situation does not demand or merit a physical response, the Muslim should still be in the mode of sacrifice and striving. Because without striving we are not going to be able to attain anything. It's like somebody comes and tries to smash what you are building. Every time you build something somebody comes and hacks away at the roots and they don't stop. So as soon as you build you have to build a bit more because they already caused some damage. So during a war you may have an airport and the air force and they come and put craters in your runway. You fill the craters and you fly again. Then they come and bomb again. You fill the craters and you fly again. You have to constantly repair. And we have been told, fight against the mushrikun with your hand, with your tongue, with your cells. It's okay. If we are not supposed to be doing physical stuff, well, how about the striving in sense of spending and calling and propagating truth and visiting friends and inviting them to come? All these type of things. That sense of striving. That I'm there on the move and I'm sweating for it. I feel tired. I've done some work for Islam today. Where's that drive? Life just goes on. Anyway, what this ayah is saying is that if we love Allah, the love for Allah expresses itself through humility towards the believers. So if we want to check that we are truly in love with Allah, we are cultivating proper increase or growth of faith, we have to see how we are treating one another. How we are expressing this love of Allah in our relationship with the believers. And here is the hadith from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said charity does not decrease the property. In three things he said in this hadith. First, Charity does not decrease the property. If I give five pounds for my wallet now, yes, I have five pounds less in my wallet. But I don't know, because of that, how Allah is going to give me, give me increase in provisions in the future, sooner or later. I don't know how Allah is going to reward me so that I find great relief on the Day of Judgment, on account of that small charity, piling up a huge mountain of reward, credit to my account. I don't know that little bit of money I've got left now, the remaining money, how that is going to be blessed, it brings a lot of results, more than I could have expected. So yes, charity does not decrease the wealth. In physical, numerical terms, you have less money. Less. I have ten pounds, I have five pounds now. Then the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and by being forgiving, pardoning, overlooking, Allah does not increase a servant except in Izzah. That's what I said. The hadith makes it clear now. If we are going to be soft and gentle towards Muslims and take them in the spirit of brotherhood and then try to advise and correct because we have to know we're dealing with Muslims and we, we inshallah love Allah. Trying to anyway. Then it will add to our mightiness. So you can have, you can try and gain mightiness in two ways. For the deceitful way, trying to cheat and con your way into becoming strong, manipulation and so forth. 
or gain that might from Allah through gentleness towards believers. And it's the latter which was accomplished in a fantastic way in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You need to look no further. Who had the softest handshake, softest satin or silk? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who smiled the most amongst everyone at that time? That's a report. Literally, you have to accept it. We never saw anyone smiling more than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who is the one being with so much authority and power, people were simply ready to obey him and die for him, would even pick up a fledgling bird and restore it to the nest? Softness towards Allah's creation. It was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Did he ever torture anyone on purpose and hurt anybody on purpose? And well, quite the contrary. If somebody complained, he'd offer himself to be hit back in return. You know that when he was taking the rose in prayer, he shoved someone, he said, oh, you hurt me. He said, okay, you hit me back then. He was never harsh. But what did the enemies do? They quaked in their boots, months journey away, and they are full of dread because of the might of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're afraid of him. Even when he reaches us, you know, a month's journey away, he can't be here next week or the week after or the week after, at least a month away, and they are trembling in their boots. And he's such a nice, gentle, soft person. That's the might we want from Allah. Did you have bodyguards? Was he walking around in a bulletproof or armor plate in him? Was he? And then the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, going back to the hadith, and no one is humble for Allah except Allah elevates him in rank. So this is the, the beauty of uh, humility, which we don't cultivate properly. Sometimes we think it's a soft topic. It's all about being a nice person. It's not about being a nice person. It's about being a true Muslim who wants his fundamental. It's about love of Allah. It's about faith. It's about not harboring any kufr in our hearts. That's what we have seen so far. It's not something about being a nice person. It's about iman and kufr. It's about paradise and hellfire. It's about following the sunnah or following one's own taste. In Surah Al-Dukhan, the 44th chapter, verses 17 to 19, it says, We did before them try or test the people of Fir'aun, Pharaoh. There came to them a messenger most honorable. فَجَاءَهُمْ رَسُولٌ Karim, Very generous. Saying, Restore to me the servants of Allah. I am to you a messenger worthy of all trust. Inni lakum rasulun ameen. And do not be arrogant against Allah. وَأَنْ لَا تَعَالُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنِّي آتِكُمْ بِسُلْطَانٍ مُبِينٍ And don't be high and mighty. Oh, don't be over and above from Allah. I come to you with an authority that is clear, manifest. This is Musa a.s. Moses, peace be on him, referred to as a very generous person coming to Fir'aun. Well, of course, he is being called a liar. They wanted to murder him or execute him. They are oppressing his enslaved people. And he comes with a message which is going to give success to that perpetrator of wickedness. How can he be more generous than that? You are enslaved, they are beating you on your heads and they are depriving you, dispossessing you and you offer them Islam in return. That's a way of being generous for ourselves as well in this society. It's, it's, if we shouldn't simply always complain and moan about how bad and wicked and hypocritical they are, offer them Islam. Follow the example of, for example, here, Musa a.s. Anyway, so he said, don't be arrogant against Allah. Don't have this ulu. Allah says something and you want to do something else. Because you want to put yourself above Allah, as it were. How was that ayah explained by Ibn Kathir in Surah Al-Dukhan, the 44th chapter? Ibn Kathir said this ayah is, means do not be arrogant istighbar in following his verses. Don't be high and mighty against revelation. That's the first thing. Secondly, and in complying 
with his evidence. Follow the instructions that you find in those verses. And having faith in him with the proofs, with his proofs. And build Iman on revelation. Three things. Very meaningful. Because there are people who know about Islam, they, they study Quran and Sunnah, and they don't act up to it. They have not fulfilled this ayah. They are sinful. There are people who are very well-meaning. They want to please Allah. They want to come close to Him. They, they respect the Prophet ﷺ. Yet they do actions which are totally unjustified, has no root or connection to revelation. They do innovations, things drafted on later on. They are acting on understanding of faith, not based on evidence. Failure to build faith and evidence led them to this type of you know, weird a warped Iman. So yes, they'll sing the praise of the Prophet, they'll pray, they'll do all sorts of things, but innovation. So all three are important. If we don't want to be arrogant, we need to have all three. First and foremost, wholeheartedly accept everything and anything in the Quran and the Sunnah, wholesale. Then, some of those ayat and hadith contain instructions, things to be done. We try and do them as best as we can. This is what the ayat and the hadith the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, leave me with what I have left you. What I have ordered you to do, I do as much as you can. What I have forbidden you, leave it. Try your best. Second, if we, are not, if we are not arrogant people, if we want to remove pride from our hearts, this is the way we have to manage ourselves. It doesn't matter what friends around us are doing, me, myself, I am the one going to be standing in front of Allah. That's how I have to manage my life. And thirdly, Although I am very eager to follow Quran and Sunnah, I mustn't do it on ignorance. I must build faith on evidence. What did Allah say? What did the Prophet say? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now we can understand how we are going to act according to the wisdom in this hadith or the information in this hadith. From Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhuma, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever has in his heart an atom's weight of kibber will never enter paradise. So it's not a plaything, it's not a frivolous, light-hearted matter. It's not something we can just pass by and say, well, it's all about good character, isn't it? No. It's you. You decide what you want to do. You have a choice. You want to go to paradise or not? The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if we have even an iota, a shade of this type of pride, it will not allow us to enter paradise. So, of course, the clarification was there, and we take the definition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, is it the pride that you were talking about? Is it the happiness or the pleasure we feel when we wear nice clothes, you know, beautiful shoes and so on? That's natural. You buy a new car, you'd like your friends to admire it. You know, I bought this car, what do you think? You know, and you feel happy and they say, Mashallah, well done, good bargain. Is that what we're talking about? No. Because the man said, you know, we, you know, sometimes someone likes to wear his beautiful folk and the fine garment and shoes and so on is that pride and the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah is beautiful Jameel and he likes what is beautiful yeah by all means without being extravagant wasteful and so on without indulging in haram spruce yourself up be neat and tidy and nice thick and stand but Al-Kibr going back to the hadith Al-Kibr is disregarding the truth Haq and haq is not just truth in English, it means rights as well. So you can say, I believe what Allah says, I believe what the Quran says, and then you go around left, right and center, withholding rights from people. Like for example, in a social dimension, not taking the permission of the wali, the guardian, in marriage. It's the father's right. The girl can't simply run away from home, you can't simply bypass the father and arrange with a friend to get, her, to get married to her. It's like this. It's the father's right. So you have not regarded the truth, the haq in this case. So it's disregarding the haq, truth, and to hold the people in content. It's destructive. It cancels out iman. That is why it is not tolerated to have even a, a spot of it in our hearts. So this is what we have to get on with all the time. Whatever, whichever position we are in, whichever group we belong to, whatever social responsibility I have, 
At the end of the day, I have given, I've been given this very severe warning and I have to make sure I've lost all pride from my heart regarding the truth, you know, disregarding the truth and looking down on people. When we disregard truth, we end up disregarding Allah. So it is a contempt, a contempt or it is an abuse or a hatred towards Allah. When we look down upon the believers and people in general, it's towards His creation. You can't have anything worse than that. You end up hating both Allah and His creation. It cancels out Iman, as scholars have said. Rather, we should have even a spot of Iman, pure Iman, and no pride. And a lot of information, a lot of Quran and Sunnah, and all these kind of things, and walk about with pride. Where in some cases we fail to accept the truth due to lack of modesty. Because the second hadith says, No one will enter the fire in whose heart there is faith, the weight of a mustard seed, a grain of mustard. But if you have the weight of a mustard seed of pride, you can't go. You can't go to heaven. So it's better off to have a small amount of pure faith instead of having a lot of so-called mixed up faith and information and pride as well. So it's not a problem not knowing much about Islam to start with, at all. It's not a problem at all not doing very much about Islam, at all. As long as we start off on a pure footing and maintain the purity of the faith and then grow on that, little by little. But there are some of us who are rushing and running away with knowledge as it were, all academic and intellectual and reading this and going there and not, no actions, no kind of reformation of character. So, who are they harming? Themselves first and foremost. And that's what the Quran talks about, the three categories of people. One of them are the oppressors against themselves. They are oppressing themselves. So, Iman has levels as we understand, alhamdulillah. Faith goes up and down, we understand that as well, alhamdulillah. So, one can be a Muslim, he gains deeper faith and understanding, and does more of the actions of faith, he becomes a mu'min, and he gains more and more devotedness and you know, consciousness of Allah. So then he becomes completely, whatever he does according to the pleasure of Allah, becomes a muhsin. But just like that, humility also goes up and down and has length. And this proves to us that if we, have, if we are truly muhsinun people, we were the humblest on the earth. If we are mu'minun, we are very humble. We are Muslims, we are humble. That's one way to see who is truly knowledgeable or, more, or better. Because the Quranic criterion is there. In uh, Al-Hujurat, the one who has more piety is the better of you. So how do we know he has more piety? Well, let's see if he's more humble or not. That expresses outwardly. We have to judge by the outward actions. So it's not like a no-go situation. You can't say, well, I can't look into his heart. How do we know he's more pious? Oh, we're all confused. We're all the same as each other. No. As long as the person is openly following the Qur'an and the Sunnah and at the same time is humble, he has greater piety than you if you're not as good as him in humbleness. So if you find a person who knows more than you and practices more than you but is harsh and rough and quick to temper and you know, all these kind of things, you know what the Qur'anic criterion is, you know how they understand from the Hadith. He is not. He is somewhat of a fake or a charlatan. And that's why we have so much problems in our society. These kind of people who go around browbeating and, you know, condemning and shouting and name-calling and all name of Islam. And he makes a nice speech or he sounds so full of information and can write books and you wonder why so much havoc amongst our unity and brotherhood and so on. Because of this. No humility. So the scholars, they explain this, inshallah. Some of the, so some of the quotes are ten minutes left. Uh, one of them said, this is coming down to practical matters, this modesty or humility is really acceptance of the truth from whoever says it. See, it cuts right at the core, right at the heart of the attitude nowadays we find amongst ourselves. Yeah, I know it's a truth, but I don't want to take it from him. Oh, well, that group said it, you see. For well, this organization, they have dodgy some. No. Is it the truth or not? I mean, come on, be serious. We are Muslims, we are asking Allah for guidance, we have a discipline, we have the Qur'an and the Sunnah, we check against it, we have the standard. So don't you trust in Allah's guidance? Don't you think He'll guide you to the truth and help you? 
So if we are asking Allah, oh Allah guide me, increase me in knowledge, you know, protect me from damaging knowledge, you know, give me knowledge that's beneficial. At the same time, we go back to Quran and Sunnah to cross-check whether what we're hearing is correct or not. So why can't you learn from anybody and everybody? Generally speaking. <coughs> the die-hard, you know, hardcore innovators classified with proof by scholars, we relieve them. Are we all like that? Every organization like that. When we are told that knowledge is the lost property of a Muslim or the lost animal, whatever he finds, he takes is his, what does it mean? It's a lost property only amongst ourselves? You can never lose a thing somewhere else? You only lose your things in your own house? The acceptance of the truth from whoever says it, small or big, honorable or loathsome, free or slave, male or female. There's no room for prejudice in accepting the truth. And well, I can't have it because he's saying so. Also, the scholar said, is shattering the heart for Allah. When we talked about sweetness of faith, we explained from Surah, Allah, Surah Ibrahim, uh, the 14th ayah, that's 14th chapter, verse 18, where Allah gave an analogy with respect to a tree, a good tree. And we mentioned that the Iman is placed in the heart. So shattering the heart means we break the barrier and let the Iman be planted or the truth seep in, absorb the guidance. Let it then embed itself and let it sprout. The shattering the heart for Allah, that is modesty. Don't put up an argument and a justification and resistance and so on because we're too proud to admit that we didn't know and our opponent happened to know. What is important is the truth was there. So it's shattering the heart for Allah and lowering the wing of humility and mercy for His creation. Whoever does not show mercy will not be shown mercy. So we are the humblest people and we have been told in a graphical way how to be merciful. Even when we have to, out of necessity, slaughter animals for food, because even then we exercise mercy for us. We are loath to cause you know, unneeded pain to the animal. We do that. Also, another ha statement from Fudair ibn Iyad, he said, Atawadu or humility is, he surrenders to the truth and follows it and accepts it from whoever says, surrendering to the truth. It's another way to remember it. If I'm basically getting too technical, just put your hands up and surrender. Well, that's the truth, I give in. You've captured me. How are these people going to be collected on the Day of Judgment? These people who fail to become truly modest, they don't try to become modest, they maintain their arrogance and pride, and they want to just be stuck up and just argue and hold a position and don't want to budge an inch and any kind of thing. How are they going to be shown up on the Day of Judgment? Because pride is all about appearing to be bigger than what you are, projecting a larger than life picture deceitfully. It's all about trying to appear bigger than normal. I'm not as, perhaps I'm not as good, um, as brilliant as some, somebody else, but then I try to appear to be as clever as him. This kind of thing. So these big people, so-called big people who walk about, how are they going to be? Hadith, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the mutakabbirun will be gathered on the Day of Judgment like specks in the form of men. Like small dots, specks. Some scholars explain it means like small red ants. Truly weightless, tiny, but in proportion of a human being with the same features. Hand, feet, nose, mouth, everything. So these people are walking about so big now, appearing to be big and tall and high and mighty and so forth. And everybody thinks, mashallah, what a great guy. Physically on the earth will be shown up to be just how worthless and weightless and tiny they are really. Allah will reduce them in size completely right down at the feet of other people. So Mutakabirun will be gathered on the Day of Judgment like specks in the form of men. Shame and humiliation will cover them from every place and will be given to drink in the prison of Jahannam called Bulas. It's a special type of a, a place in there. A fire, a canopy of fire will be above them and they will also be given another type of drink from juice sque squeezed from inmates of hellfire which will drive them mad 
as you know, a maddening time. So all sorts of horrible punishment, but the main thing is just look at how Allah will show them up by physically reducing their sizes. So let's not try to be ten feet tall now, we are not ten feet tall. Let us try to be Muslims who are humble and they try to be tall in front of Allah through the righteousness. So they are striving, they are working hard and they, they just care for how much reward they are gaining, inshallah. Because that's the, that's the way they are going to be. It's like storing up things in their so-called account. Their treasure chest, they are hoarding it for the day of Allah. Also hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there are three people, three types of people to whom Allah will not speak speak to on the day of judgment nor will He look at them nor will He purify them and for them is a painful punishment if Allah does not purify us on the day of judgment then somehow, we, if we are Muslims we have to be purified in hellfire if I'm not cleansed on earth if I'm not cleansed in barzakh, in the grave if I'm not cleansed while waiting on the Day of Judgment for the trial, how am I going to be cleansed now if he's going to cleanse, cleanse me himself? Through the fire. That's what painful punishment means in this context. So definitely that person is inviting <coughs> hellfire for himself. These three types of people. Who are they? The habitual adulterer or Shaykh Uzanim means he could be an old adulterer. Old person. Should be out of it by now. But he is in it. Or the one who has become good at it, you know, habitual adulterer, or fornicator. Secondly, Malik Kadhab, that's the person who has the artful lie, he's become a king of lies, lying, so he's like good at it, he can get away with it a lot. He can lie convincingly. That's what you are taught, isn't it, in the courts, when you have to be in, the, in front of the judge and stuff like that. That's what um, the debating is all about. In the, in the old days, the debating with logic was all about that you can prove yourself right, you can win the argument even though your position is false. That's why they would employ kalam and so forth. That's why it's hated so much in Islam. Because the use of kalam, and this kind of what we call scholasticism and so forth, rational logic and so on, is about winning arguments even though you're wrong. Art of debating. Accomplished liar and the third group of people, the impoverished, arrogant one, the ayyal mistakbir. Like he's poor and he's hard up or he hasn't got that much means and he's too proud. So he has to maintain artificially a higher standard of living and so forth. And people do. It truly becomes very clear, especially in Asian communities, when a wedding is taking place and you find a person of humble means goes out of his way to throw a lavish dinner and a, buy big expensive gifts and stuff like that. Oh, otherwise, what can my friend say? Otherwise, what will society say, you know? Relatives will be upset and so on. And they rather go into debt. Pride. Anyway, so let us finish now, inshallah. I wanted to read this thing out to you. Um, this is uh, the... I would put this in the borderline on the fringe... Uh, you know, nutcase people who do these kind of things. But it's not, because it's, it, is, it is now in the Jerusalem Post, last Friday, the Jerusalem Post, the Daniel Pipes. It's written, it's talking about something called Ibn al-Warraq. This guy, he's not only attacked the Qur'an, he's got a whole night, big book out now. This guy is now writing about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is a director of the Philadelphia Middle East Forum. So, imagine, somebody who is teaching Middle Eastern sciences or history and culture or Islam and arts and so forth, a director of that forum. And he's going to write things like this. This is his view. Okay. And he's now written his first book on early Islamic history. Okay. So what is that? So this great expert, what is he saying? He's saying, now look at some of the ridiculous, I mean it's like laughable, but this is not the length they're going to. First he's picking at uh, somebody called Montgomery Watt, he's another Orientalist Garfield, you know, filthy guy. And he's, he's, he's supposed to be more knowledgeable about Islam, so he writes balanced stuff. And this guy's refuting him. So it's like, you know, the pig gnawing at the dog, that kind of thing. So, he says, 
resources that survive, talking about the Prophet وسلم, dramatically contradict the standard biography. And he's talking about fragments of material, papyri and inscriptions and coins and stuff like that. So he's now, he's saying that scholars have now begun to found, find groundbreaking work. The startling and amazing and interesting conclusions are coming through. What is it? First, he's quoting Mr. Crone, son of Crone. He finds that Muhammad Sallallahu career took place not in Mecca, but hundreds of kilometers to the north. Now, this is laughable. They are challenging Islam like this now. That is questioning that even he was in Mecca. And two other guys named the mention, he says, finds that the classical Arabic language, the language of the Quran, was not developed today in, in, the, in the Saudi, but in the Levant, which is hundreds of kilometers away. Then he says, the Arab tribesmen who conquered great swaths of territory in the 7th century were not Muslims, perhaps they were pagans. He's not taking an attack on the Sahaba, they were pagans. The Quran is not a product of Muhammad, or even of Arabia, but a collection of early Judeo-Christian liturgical materials stitched together to meet the needs of a later age. So you can see the conclusion, they're like bombastically wrong. Yet these people find authority and prestige and honor and they're given a platform and their books are promoted. If we are not humble to the meaning of mission, if we are not humble to the truth, what will happen is what he says at the conclusion. At the conclusion he says, Muslims one day are likely to be consumed by efforts to respond to his challenges. These type of challenges just as happened to Jews and Christians in the 19th century when they faced comparable scholarly inquiries. Those two faiths, Judaism and Christianity, survived the experience, though they changed profoundly in the process. And so will Islam. That's what he's hoping for. That's why they attack, even though it's ridiculous, because they can bank on the ignorance of the people. Muslims and non-Muslims. If we don't learn knowledge and we don't try and protect these types of attacks, that's what they're gunning for all the time, whether it's secularization process or through their artificial academia. They want Islam to change. That's what they're hoping for. They can make a, rid a ridiculous assertion and they can bank on the ignorance of the people, Muslims or non-Muslims. That's what they're hoping will happen. So we finish now, inshallah ta'ala, the last hadith. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah has revealed to me that you should not that you should be humble until one sees no pride in himself above the other. Allah has revealed to, upon me that you should be humble until one does not pride himself above the other, and until one does not envy over the other. So this pride and this is what we're talking about, following Allah and His Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, inshallah ta'ala, it must translate into a better conduct towards one another. May Allah guide me and guide you, unite us upon the truth, cleanse our hearts and souls. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help the mujahideen, whatever they are, whoever they are. Those of them who have passed away, may Allah accept them as shuhada and grant them the best of places in paradise. May Allah support their families and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala console their parents. Amen.